Welcome to Annotations to Art, Politics and Life Itself. My name is Nico Heller. My guest today is Linka Petrokova. Linka is a leading international architect who has worked in New York, London, Vienna and Bratislava. Since May 2017, she's worked with Asaha Hadid Architects in London, where she is the lead architect. She's worked on over 40 projects in 10 countries and spent most of her time working in high race building design. Her personal and academic work has been exhibited internationally at the Dubai Expo in 2020, the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, and at the Vienna Biennale, as well as in Vienna, Slin, Bratislava, and Beijing. Linka has received numerous awards, including in 2020, the Grand Prix Award for Architecture and Innovation of the Sea. And I can see that Linka has already arrived, so do let me invite her in. Linka, good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> I'm so glad that this time it worked. My apologies again that, that I couldn't actually connect with you last time. My cursor had disappeared on, on the laptop and I simply couldn't navigate my laptop. I had to take it to the shop and they fixed it. Really, really sorry about that. Linka, let's dive straight in because you mentioned that you have to leave five minutes early. So I'm kind of trying to uh, condense it a little bit. In my program notes uh, to this dialogue, I'm suggesting that your futuristic designs are inspired by your love and study of nature. But improvements in technology, digital design, AI integration and material developments enable you to design organic structures, often on an epic scale, um, that promote community, are sustainable and are operationally efficient. Beauty in architecture, as in nature, you seem to suggest, is not a goal in itself, but the manifestation of a well-functioning organism. Is that a fair characterization? Yes, I think you, you summarize it pretty well. Okay, so how how do you how do you how do you operationalize this? I mean, you know, obviously nature is kind of sort of pre-existing and, and and so on and so forth. But how do you actually get into this way of thinking, into this way of designing? What is your what is what is your approach? I think there are you know multiple levels uh, on which these can be um, approached. So when we look um, at the, at a project, you know, the eight continent. Uh, which is, you know, uh, one of my uh, world-known projects. Uh, it's important to to think about it not just as uh, a linear development uh, or one idea and then it develops from there, but it's about um, a synthesis of, uh, of of different things. So if we start, for example, with the program uh, of the station. Uh, when I was designing the program, you know, I, I had a look at multiple organs. Uh, those are living within the ocean. This can be algae, seaweed, mussels, uh, fish holes, octopuses, you know, different animals. And I was looking at how do they uh, actually uh, survive within the ocean? What is the the energy um, efficiency they use, how they how they you know produce or 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 uh, kind of um, gather the energy from the environment, how they work with their resources, uh, you know how they work with the nutrition, how they react to the environment, are they flexible? Let's say like a seaweed in the water, uh, or you know how they react with the with the current, let's say as as fish schools change their directions and, and interact with each other. So, uh, you know, it was already in the first step, the way how I approached the project from the program side and, and from thinking about it uh, was, you know, by learning from the environment and learning from many different organs within this environment. So let's say there was the programmatic side, but then when I go farther, uh, you know, let's say from the programmatic side, I got some idea about how I could work with, with the energy, with the resources within the station. But the next step was, okay, what is the structural solution that I'm looking for? And and I was looking at, again, the processes, uh, those are in the nature. Let's say the looking at the lily pads. Uh, how the lily pads can sustain on the water surface that, you know, 
uh, it's about the materiality as much as it is about the geometry. Uh, it's about their little infills of air pockets. Uh, those those help them to to be above the water. And it is looking at different scales. You know, the nano scale, the material scale, as much as it is about the overall geometrical scale. Um, so I I do believe that you no. Know, gathering inspiration from nature uh, is not really a, a linear process that you just pick one and you go with that. It could be in some some cases. I mean, we saw it uh, in, in biomimicry. Uh, we saw it in some examples, you know, where it would be one idea that just can be translated. Although in, in architecture and on such a big scale as, as uh, you know, the eighth continent or similarly, it has to be more about um, understanding the environment and understanding it through the organisms that already live there and are able to survive, I think it's a really good way because nature had, you know, millions of years to, to test and develop the organisms. So there is a lot we can learn from. And the learning is not only about mimicking, but it's about understanding the systems, how they work and how they can change. So, so when we apply them to the to architecture, we can actually find the solutions that fit as much the engineering as they fit the environment. It's interesting when 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 I when I reflected on this idea, um, you know that 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 beauty is actually a manifestation for well functioning system. It it's sort of it's almost like a, an an inverse kind of uh, definition of architecture compared to like say simply Le Corbusier. I mean Le Corbusier had this idea, you know, the very famous you know you know form follows function or you know argue, you know like the building is a machine to live in, and it's quite interesting because if you know, this idea of form follows function, the forms that Le Corbusier came up with were quite, I, I don't want to say unhuman, but they had obviously done something quite machine-like. And I think from sort of a today's perspective, we probably would knock these buildings down if they weren't from Le Corbusier, because they're kind of very, they're quite brutalist uh, in, in, in the architecture. And so, so this idea that, you know, form follows function in Le Corbusier's kind of architecture follows a very different path. Because of course, your forms are organic, they're round, they, they're kind of, they, they seem to embrace life. In fact, they seem to be part of it. So if you think about sort of this kind of sort of classic modernist kind of notion of form follows function you set this next to your own definition that beauty is a manifestation of a well-functioning organism then then this is a really an alternative way of thinking about architecture which is still very modern but it's kind of it's almost like turning Le Corbusier on his on his head uh, do you have any thoughts on that yes uh, you know in the let's say the first look as well the forms I I create or you know I like to work with. Many people can still think that it is just a formal exercise because we we don't have relationship with architecture in that way. I think we are um in, in the general sense, you know, still kind of thinking about building being a cube. Um we are used to architecture based on the way how we are used to fabrication. So everything is orthogonal, our shelves are orthogonal, you know, the way how we develop the tools to actually work with the spaces. But um, but it's not true, you know, how I was saying, it's it's more about the building performance, what, what really interests me and the building performance. Um, but as well, the function of the geometries, you know, the function of them, they have to float, they have to, you know, react to the environment. It's just the function is a little bit in a different sense that, let's say, what you describe with like Corbus here. But, you know, there are still kind of similarities if we say it has to be functionally, you know, adaptable. Um, and... Um, so, so, so there, there can be still a, a similarities between, you know, form follow function, building performance. Do, do you yeah. know what I kind of? I mean, what, what, what I was thinking was is that in a way, of course, there's a similarity, and I can see, you know, where you're coming from. I can see the sort of the, the if you like, the the school of thought that you're following. I can totally see that. Um, but my, my sense is that you're adding 
a, a, an additional kind of process, if you like. So for Le Corbusier, and I think modernism in general, man was quite separate from nature. Yeah. Uh, and so, so Le Corbusier didn't start with this idea of an organism like a human being. But he started with a kind of almost a Freudian notion of needs. So what do we, you know, you know, what, what are our needs, you know, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and and this is very practical needs. It's to do with, you know, like shelter and heating and this and then the other. And it goes on from there, you know, security, whatever. And then the building itself has needs to do with efficiencies and so on and so forth. So, so see, he was building it up from there. And it's almost as if he totally forgot nature and the process. And what, what he kind of ended up with was kind of something quite artificial. Um, now, um, you all seem to be starting from a very different place. You seem to be starting from a sort of a, a notion that, that we're part of nature. Yes, that is, that's, that's a fair conclusion. Um, and, and it's true, but, but I would say that, you know, still the, the bar is that the architecture has to answer to functions that it has. Like the eighth continent, the station, you know, although it is shaped, by the environmental performances and, and the needs of the environment. It still as well in the programmatic way, you know, considers that there has to be someone who is living on the station, there are researchers, but the way how I answer to it are a little bit different. And, and you know, it's again, looking at modularity, looking, you know, at, at learning actually how how organisms are living within within the, the water space. So it is still answering the, the needs of the person because in fact we are creating architecture for people to live in. But um, but it's putting you know the needs of the of the people at the same place as as the needs to answer to the environment. So so yes, I am I'm bringing in, in my designs more, I believe the the environment and the consideration of the performance, uh, then then it might have been um, in in the Le Corbusier example that you used, but I would say it is um, as well currently um, starting to be the discourse in architecture uh, because even when we look at at something like parametricism and we look at uh, then the the current development that Patrick Schumacher uh, calls tectonism. You know, it's a lot about looking at the forms, um, about uh, on how they perform, and then uh, you know, adjusting the performance with the parameters that we include in the designs, and then in tectonism as well. You know, following uh, the the process of the fabrication of these forms, and because we really advanced, we advanced a lot in the in the last you know fifty years, let's say. We do have now as an architect this much better, uh, you know, tools, softwares, materials at hand. So we are actually now in the time where we are able to do this shift towards, you know, a better performance of the buildings and and include more these the similarities with nature and you know design this second nature in a way uh, in in architecture. What previously was not and but uh, the um, uh, the idea of taking inspiration from nature is here you know for for centuries in fact you know if we look uh, even at um, uh, at you know Frank Gehry's uh, the the waterfall house he was trying to integrate his architecture into nature although the outcome was very different than you know what we might have to now and um but but there was this notion if we look at back uh, back minister fuller uh if we look as well at, at more certain examples uh like the um the gherkin tower from foster partners in london which is taking uh you know inspiration from from mushroom structure underwater mushrooms so there is this ongoing notion of you know we are learning in architecture from the nature and there are just different ways how over the the centuries actually architects were able to implement it and today is the the really really interesting point that that as the tools develop further as we progress with 
uh, with you know uh, computer processes, with 3D printing, 4D printing, with material engineering. We are much better uh, in, in learning uh, from the nature and implementing it in a kind of more natural way and systematic way than just mimicking the forms. It's interesting. I mean, with the, the eighth continent, and we come back to that, and I will play a little short film later on for our viewers to so get a better idea of, of what we're actually talking about there. But but in with the eighth continent, it is quite um it, it's it, th th there's a sort of a kind of a, a holistic aspect to it. It's 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 placed in the sea. Um it, it it it's not it's not it doesn't have a singular function, but it's 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 heavily integrated around sort of a cluster of functions which all kind of feed off each other. So it's a kind of it is very much like an organism. So I think that metaphor works really well there. And of course, that you would look at sort of organism in the sea, how they live in the sea, to seek inspiration and to 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 begin to think about what such an organism might look like is is a very logical way of going about it. Now in other kind of like building designs, um, obviously you have a much more diverse sort of user base. Um, and, and so you don't have the same level of conceptual integration. Um, and maybe the, the, the notion of organism doesn't work quite so well, but you have also another kind of way of looking at it, I believe. And that's, or maybe I'm putting words into your mouth here, but that's, you know, this idea of an ecosystem, which is like, organisms working together. Um, and, and, and and that's another interesting thing. And you, I think at one point you said something like, you know, architects are about starting conversations. And so when you think about a building, not just as an organism, but as an ecosystem, and of course you can build out from there to city planning or town planning or, you know, urban planning in general as, as a kind of, as an even larger kind of scale, uh, sort of like ecosystem. Um, how do you approach, how do you scale this up from this notion of an organism to this notion of an ecosystem? I believe that, you know, the, the process is, is not so much different in the way that when we are looking at organism, it is not just a singular use or is not just a single function. I mean, if you look at a human organism, you know, we have kidneys, we have stomach, we have heart, we have lungs. And each of them has an entirely different function in a way. But they together uh, make our body work and um, and we need each of them because because otherwise, you know, um, the organism will, will not survive. And when you are looking at an ecosystem, you are in the similar way looking at at different entities, those might have very different functions, but in the end, they need to support each other to to create that balanced ecosystem. When uh, when I was working, you know, on the eight continents, what I was looking at was how these functions can support each other in a way of of closed loops and and the flow of resources, energy, waste. And how one, which is a, a you know outcome of one system, can become an input of another one, and and this is what can be you know very much scalable on the ecosystem way uh, or ecosystem scale or or urban scale, because we will be looking at you know a different uh, functions within you know the, the urban scale and how they can support each other, and it might be actually easier in that sense on the urban scale level, uh, because, you know, you might have um, a restaurant that has a certain base that can feed into greenhouses and, and in similar way. Um, so you are looking at, at much, much bigger program units, but at the same time, you should not forget about, you know, how each of these program units has to work on its own. And actually it's not just then about the flow of the resources within the city, but still it's about the flow of the resources within each single unit. And in that way, it's, it's very much as, as you can find it in, in the organs in our body or, you know, in one organism, you know, in nature, it's everything about this, this scalability, like scaling from, from very small units to, to the full organism. And then, you know, how this each of the organs works within the ecosystem. But uh, it's it's about 
you know, looking at every single part. And I do believe that what we are still struggling with, and it is kind of progressing to better, is is this understanding on the nano level, on the small scale, on the material scale, which actually makes the big difference between the architecture, which is, you know, human made and, and you know, engineered by us, and the one, uh, you know, the architecture, let's say, of the organisms, those are in nature, because we are still lacking this ability to to put, you know, the, the nanoscale um, smartness of the materials into the architecture. And that is restraining us from, you know, having um, envelopes that can respond because we need to uh, so much focus on technology that can make us do it. And and I think this is this is kind of the pivotal moment in architecture that actually today we are starting to have the access to to you know this material engineering that in some sense is like 4D printing and, and hopefully there is going to be more development in that can help us to do that. So so for me the move from the small to the big is is quite easy because we are used, you know, to work on big scale. Architecture is, in uh, in fact, quite a large scale compared to, you know, plants or or, or any other organs. But but we have the the problem of understanding the, the nano scale to be able to to adjust the large ones. I want to come back once more to this, and I find this a really important distinction between this notion of a machine to live in. Uh, and, and an organism. I mean, what, one of the fundamental distinctions there for me is, is that a machine is something we operate. We're external to it. Yeah, we, you know, we drive it, we, we, we operate it. Uh, whereas an organism, we're kind of part of it. Um, and this is a very, very different, when you think about architecture, whether it's something you operate or whether it's something you, you're a, a living part of. It's a very different thing. And I'm just thinking in terms of say, sort of, you know, smart, you know, smart homes, smart architecture, smart cities, uh, the, you know, where that symbiosis is kind of beginning to, to happen. Um, can, I mean, I find this a really interesting. And do you think this is potentially one of the big shifts in architecture in the 21st century that we're moving from a, a conception of building as something external to ourselves uh, to a notion of architecture you know, which basically says we're part of the building or part of the landscape. I mean, this is a very interesting idea and and I don't believe it is yet so much, you know, developed in architecture or it's yet so much part of of, of the, the global design. And, you know, maybe maybe part of it, what, what we need to change in being able to, to come to that point, you know, to be part of something is, is as well, um, you know, the, the intention of why we are building architecture. Because in many senses, you know, it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very private thing. Like you're going to build your own house and you want your house to be according to your dreams and what you believe in. And if we we want to be part of the ecosystem, we would need to reduce what we are putting it as a restrictions into the brief of what are our intentions for our personal use or preferences. And we would need to dial up what what is, you know, what we need in the building to be part of the ecosystem. And this is this is a quite of a radical shift, I would say, in the way how we think about architecture and how we think about, you know, what it should achieve. And and it shifts from being a monument to being a, you know, part of something bigger. And um and you know, there can be still a uh there can be still monument architecture and and maybe it's just about, you know, finding as well the the right balance between how we really do this transition and and you know uh, what it really is and how how it can uh, you know integrate uh, into uh, into the bigger society as well. I mean, it's interesting when when you look back at sort of architecture in, in the kind of the broadest uh, sense of the word th throughout the millennia, and you sort of stop nomadic architecture like tents and yachts and whatever. 
um, and then sort of early settlements and then into kind of increasingly into in, into a sort of a settled and then into the modern modern age. I, I mean, I, I sort of I, I'm sort of hypothesizing. I don't know. This is just a sort of a, an idea whether kind of early like nomadic architecture, for example, um, was a far more would more embody the lives of the inhabitants, you know, in, in a way. Um, and, and then, of course, early settlers also rural architecture, a farming kind of, you know, like an old farm that has been lived in for a long time and who's been molded around very much the, the persons or the people that live in it. Um, that, that notion sort of of a kind of an extension of self, you know, whether, whether if you like the kind of uh, the life of the inhabitants is inscribed in the building. Um, and, and not just in kind of in terms of the wallpaper and the, the lampshades, but I, I mean, really in terms of function as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in terms of rituals and, and, and habits and so on and so forth. I mean, taking this into modern architecture, I'm thinking about say a modern corporation who has got a very specific sets of needs. They want innovative meetings to happen. They want transparency. They want all kinds of mobility. They want change. They want this and the other. They want a high degree of flexibility. There's a sort of a sense of who they are as an organization and the architecture in a way should embody that, should become that um in you know in a similar way to in the way architecture would have become that naturally in a previous age over time and now we're kind of trying to somehow condense that process into a planning process so that the outcome is something that embodies uh, the inhabitants of the building is that is that something and this is quite different from what Le Corbusier would have done because he would have been much more generic in his definition of function uh, is that is that a fair comment to make I think there are multiple levels to this comment. Like in the in the first instance, you know, you, you talk about the nomadic architecture, and um, I I had a chance to recently see you know some um, some habitats from uh, Maya people. Uh, uh, sorry, not Maya Maasai people in 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 Africa, and uh, they they as well kind of used to travel so they would not stay for a long time uh, in the same location so the houses they they build from soil and what they found around you know they would build a house in three weeks and then after I don't know a few months or, or, or a year they would move to another location and again just build this this simple house and and in this sense this is very different to what I talk about because yes it is in a way, part of the ecosystem because you just take the the materials; those are in the surrounding. You create, you know, your uh, your shelter from it, uh, and when you when you leave, this can easily become a part of the environment because it is just the same material and it can, you know, easily dissolve. But what is not, you know, part of it is is the way how it is part of the ecosystem beyond being it from the same material. It doesn't have, you know, functions to support the environment, like when we look at the continent, which means the ocean, uh, or, you know, if we would put it in a different scale, you know, maybe the architecture that as well can clean the air, can, you know, recycle the water, can, can do a number of, of elements. Those are similar to organs living, uh, living in the environment. When we talk about sustainability, beyond having the minimal impact in the environment, but about sustainability, which supports or building supports the environment. So I do have this belief that the, the, the traditional architecture, although the nomadic architecture, although it might have had the least impact, it was not as developed as, you know, what we are talking about now, because it was, it was lacking in some senses. And um, so, so for me, it is more about the, the architecture which you know takes the systematic and if you if you are building the shelter from a soil there is not much systematic you do you know you could then make a comparison to other animals you know using their tools to to build a, shel a shelter like ants you know they would build from soil their their shelters but but this is not exactly what what is the architecture supporting the environment in, in my sense. And then when you are talking, you know, about um, if, you know, yes, the, the architecture and the buildings, you know, looking in the historical sense, um, you, you might have them 
developed over years or centuries in case we look at some of the castles or you know some of the architecture and and it's really interesting to see you know how the owner might have changed and how you know the the building changed and i think to a certain extent it's happening as well now in in new buildings because you know it always depends what we take as an example because um buildings uh, and, and the construction industry is such a vast that you can really find examples of, of multiple types but but if we are looking uh, into the discourse of architecture you know today we we stand at the point where there is a, a big push against demolitions there is a big push towards you know building architecture that is sustainable in a way as well that it can change the functions or the functions can be adjustable because we saw that, you know, as well just in the last 70 years, let's say in the in the buildings uh, for for residential use, there is such a big change in, in what are the needs of the inhabitants, uh, what is the technological support, what are the services we need that, uh, that we need to upgrade all of those buildings. And and I think that you know this notion of having buildings refurbished and change and and you know um, translated into the needs of the, of the new generation. This is still happening, although you know it is at a different scale, uh, or we don't have yet maybe so many examples uh, that that would show this progress. The, the reason why I mentioned the kind of the nomadic art, and, and actually I think you make an interesting point. I mean, because there's this, <clears throat> there is this, a, a sort of a, a de degrees to it, isn't there? There's kind of, um, if you like, there's there's architecture that 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 essentially is is just is what it is, but it's not meant to be sustainable. It may not have to even be because maybe life sustains itself. But then there's this notion that we now need to think about sustainability and it has to become uh, sustainable over the long term. But in, in recent years, we have come to sort of realize that sustainability actually, especially when it comes to climate change and, and also other aspects of environmental uh, degradation, that sustainability actually, because we've kind of reached beyond a certain point, may no longer be sufficient. So we need sort of regenerative uh, solutions, solutions that go beyond just sustaining the status quo, but kind of regenerating, you know, the environment to bring it back to a sustainable level. And I think that you, you made this point very clearly. Now, of course, nomadic architecture didn't have those those problems. Uh, and, and of course, it didn't kind of. So, so yes, it's probably not even sustainable in that sense. It's just in this in, in this kind of original state. But the reason why I mentioned it, and I think this is interesting, is because it's all built around mobility. So, so you know, uh, and it's built around mobility, not in an absolutist sense, because there's still a kind of a culture of, you know, of community and this, that and the other, which also is integrated into this kind of nomadic life, you know, from the round shape of the tents to this, that and the other. I, I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just but for me, this is an interesting example of how an architecture has grown around a, a particular way of living. Um, and, and so I thought that was it. And it's in, it's 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 quite simple in that sense because it is it's a, it's a fairly um uh you know it's a it's 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 quite a transparent i think example uh, that, that's why i mentioned it and of course um you mentioned the sort of the castles in the middle Ages, and of course it's interesting to see this because of course one of the reasons why they had these big walls and the defenses is because it reflects a certain sort of injustice or inequality in society and the well-to-do, the, the well-off people, they had to protect themselves against those who had less, and that's the, the builders' castles uh, to to protect their wealth. It's it's very interesting. We look at it through a kind of romantic classes today, but when you think about it, these were castles. These were sort of you know fortified structures um, that, that were meant to keep people out uh, and keep the people inside safe. And and so it's it's an interesting thing what what how priorities changed over over, over time. Uh, and and yes, in today's world, it's far more diffuse and it's very hard to. And of course, there is a kind of a, a line of architecture which is very, very, in fact, probably the majority of architecture, very, very cost driven, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, where developers, you know, carry a lot more weight than, say, in continental Europe, where architects are still sort of, in a way, more empowered. Um, and and so, so there is there is a kind of, and once you have that financial, when it's about square footage and about yield, then then obviously other kind of aspects begin to diffuse those you know th those those very ideas we're discussing but i think we can still see within it the kernels 
the kind of the green shoots of, of where this is headed and maybe and maybe over time those those kind of new practices uh, those new uh, uh, um ideas will become dominant and will kind of replace the current status quo um so um i mean what i what i would like to do is very briefly kind of i have this prepared to play uh, uh, uh go go to share screen and what will i do with this a moment here share screen that's right and then i'm going to kind of um do this and give it a little sense about uh to, so I, I think we have it here now um what it is that uh, the um um the eighth continent is all about um now maybe you can very briefly kind of talk a little bit about this but in a way that those who don't see the images in other words our podcast listeners uh, still uh, still um uh, if you like um um ha have you know have the benefit of of what you're saying sure um, so now we are looking at the um, at the opening scene of the video, uh, where where you, you can see you know the overall geometry of the station about the water, uh, and uh, in fact uh, you know this uh, this station is ocean cleaning and research station, so it is focusing on taking the water uh, which is in the ocean which is you know heavily. Um, uh, heavily dirty from you know particles of plastic and uh, and other debris, and uh, it's taking this water, it's cleaning it, uh, it's it's working with the natural currents and the, um, the way how it navigates uh, the water inside of the station is you know based on the on the natural currents and uh, and you know just skimming um, the the ocean top. Uh, to to gather um, the dirt which is on the top of the ocean and not really affect the ecosystems to the beyond. Uh, and once the water is you know sag inside of the station, it supports many different uh, functions. Uh, so the station is um, is you know cleaning this water, collecting the trash, the some of the trash which might be still in the in the bigger pieces can be still recycled for further use on the station. Uh, that clean water can be on one hand returned to the ocean. On the other hand, it is used to accelerate a different processes uh, within the, the station. Because we have a crew living on the station, crew of researchers, of technicians, uh, we need to support them with, uh, you know, food and nutrition. So the water is used to uh, for for hydroponic planting or for fish farming, and thanks to this, uh, it's possible to uh, to give nutrition uh, to uh, to the crew. And as well, you know, when we are talking about hydroponic planting, uh, this can be as well helping plants, or or we can look at at algae, and we are able to to further work uh, with. Um, with biofuel from these plants to secondary support with, with energy, um, the inhabitants of the station, or to support, you know, with energy, the actual cleaning process of the station. Um, so as the station is in the middle of the ocean, um, it needs to, you know, create everything from what it has in the surrounding. This being the water, the tidal energy, the solar energy. So the the tops uh, of the station or like the surfaces of the station are covered with photovoltaic cells to be able to you know gather uh, the solar energy and the extension of the station uh, which navigates um, the the waste are as well equipped with a special joints those are able to collect the tidal energy. So so really the idea was to you know take what is there. And and create a self-sustainable organism within the ocean. Yeah, this is this is really really amazing. And when 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 I, when I look at it, what, what the, the sense I get is is of a, a sort of, of of an octopus or sort of like a jellyfish with long tentacles. It, it's not what you not what you would think of as a a building which has you know which is quite sort of compact. 
Uh, this is a, a structure that has a sort of a compact core, but then it really reaches out. And it's it's a very, very interesting, very interesting structure. And of course, it does look just aesthetically in, in terms of its form, it looks very much like an organism. Um, now, um, before we finish off, I mean, you've been working on this for some time now. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, and um, and indeed, you have won the prizes with it too. It's it's quite a it's quite a a, a well received uh, project indeed. And even if it would never go any further than this, I'm sure it have, has made already made a lot of people think about what is possible. So really, really well done. But um, what I wonder, of course, I would love to see this happen. I would like this to be built. Um, and of course, I'm sure you would like to see that too. Are you making progress with this? Is there anything happening in the background? Is this moving forward in some way? Yes. Uh, you know, firstly, thank you for, for the nice introduction of the project. Um, I think what I'm now really excited about is that the project was nominated for the Earthshot Prize. Uh, what is the, the prize in, in the UK? Uh, uh, under the patronage of, of Prince William. And this is very exciting for me that it got this this recognition. Uh, of course, it's just a nomination for now, but, but that still, it's, it's a big step for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm still, you know, trying to find a ways how to, how to get funding and, you know, move these ahead. Of course, um, it is, it's a challenging project, but, um, uh, you know, going to the space was a challenging project once, and now we have so many uh, uh, stations uh, in the in the space, and you know, uh, trying to talk about uh, people going for visits into the space. So I do believe that uh, cleaning the ocean should not be uh, much more challenging than uh, you know visiting the space, and uh, I I do believe that it has for us uh, as a humanity uh, a large impact. And uh, and it should be our focus to a certain extent, uh, because we do need clean water and we do need clean ecosystem, uh, because because we see what is happening with, with our earth if if that is not the case and how really the dirty water in the ocean is affecting all of us. So um, yes, it is. Um, it's seven years now. Uh, I would say that that I am on this project, and uh, of course, because I do have another engagement. This is this is maybe uh, developing slower than than one would hope. Uh, but um, but I am dedicated to this project, and you know I'm trying to to look for uh, another funding, competitions, where to when to sign this uh, project up, and and be able to you know. Find not only funding, but actually find the partners to to work with and talk with, because this is this is project which is very uh very demanding from the engineering point of view. Um, when it happens, it's going to be you know the the first station for cleaning of the ocean in this scale, and uh, it is it's very complex. Uh, as well, you know all of the processes between you know taking the water, cleaning it, but or what to do with the treasure afterwards, or how the cleaning water is then used in the in the hydroponic systems. But I I think that you know the project as it is big and unique, it as well can be broken to small pieces, and it would be able to affect not only you know the the ocean uh, and the cleaning of it, but as well the communities. Those are you know closer to the shores. So when we are talking about you know creating a a hub which can out of a clean water then create a lot of nutrition uh, for the crew it can be as well applied to the to uh, to the shore communities uh, those might be suffering with a dirty water or with, with a lack of nutrition because they currently live in area which is heavily uh, you know destroyed uh, by the pollution so i think there are multiple ways how to look at this project and look at this project and how to proceed with it uh, i am trying to uh, you know explore many different uh, ideas and, uh, and and work on this project and and let's see you know uh, where it's it's going to go uh, in the future and and you know how is it going to uh, you know uh, not just create inspiration uh, but as well you know create the movement and the change because when you were talking about the inspiration for the people I, I do believe that this is a really really pivotal point uh, in the project 
like the project should be uh, not only about the cleaning, but about the research and education. And the education part is about, you know, uh, learning about um, you know, the problem we currently have. And I'm really glad that, you know, the project got over the last, you know, mostly the last three years, uh, really a lot of attention as it got. And I was able to talk about it with, you know, many communities all around the world or talk with, with students in schools and, uh, you know, in this way make many people aware of the problem. Um, those might not have really realized it before because, you know, in Europe, I'm from Slovakia, we don't have sea. Uh, so this might be, you know, for many people, project a uh, problem which is very distant. But in fact, it affects us as well because European countries used to, you know, sell trash to, to other countries. Those, uh, you know, or would in some cases have, issues and maybe it would as well end up in the ocean we don't know but this is a global problem that really affects every single person in the world and and it's it, i'm very glad that that i was able to talk about this absolutely i mean there, there, there's there's two sort of following questions i have here about this the first has to do you mentioned that you can break it down into into in, into into in, into into stages if you like um Th that kind of kind of I, I was thinking does that mean that you're kind of deciding this in a modular kind of way so that you could start with a basic functionality and then add if you like the functionality as the project gains in recognition and possibly funding um so so that the structure the basic structure would be sort of an entry level which could do some of the things that you'd like to do but over time, functionality would be added. Is that the way you, you see it? Or uh, when you say break it down, or how do you mean it? Yes, this is one of one of the parts. I think there are two two ways how to break it down. But uh, but this that you mentioned is, uh, you know, it's it's one of them. Because it was not in the video, but another part of this project was that it is not just this one station. Because... The, the ocean is really uh, vast and uh, and one station would not be able to to clean it all so the idea in the project uh, from the beginning was that it's cluster of stations does work and um, it would be actually only one which has um, in the cluster which has as well the support for the community and the rest of them they would be solely for for cleaning of the water and returning it to the ocean and just collecting the trash so and it would be in a module way that you know um if necessary any of the station can be further developed to have all of the support systems to have the greenhouses to have all of it but uh, but it would be you know the basic frame which is only for the cleaning which can be then you know further developed so yes, in in this way, it is it is the the module thinking about it, okay. and then um, as well when we are we are looking at it, uh, you know, in this part, what I was mentioning that you know, for example, you have the the shore communities, uh, which might have issues with the clean water, with the nutrition, you know, there, um, again, uh, in in the modular sense, they might need actually more the hydroponic part but still with the cleaning of the water. But, you know, there is for them, um, actually, we might not need just one station, which has all of it and then all of the cleaning work, but more stations, those can actually as well produce the nutrition. So so in this sense, it could be, you know, scalable for, for different locations, but as well the functions uh, could be, you know, enlarge the ones we need for certain part and, and you know, minimize the ones, those, those are not so prevalent. Excellent. Now, there's sort of a, another question which kind of relates to this, which has to do with the fact that, of, of course, technology doesn't stand still. Um, I mean, when you say you've been working on this for seven years, just think about AI, what happened in AI over the past seven years. You know, I mean, when our chat GDP has become part of a lot of people's everyday lives, uh, who would have thought that even three years ago? Um, so, so I mean, we're seeing massive acceleration of technological advances in so many different areas, and I'm sure this will affect also structures like the Eighth Continent. And so, over the you know, when you designed this seven years ago, some of the things on your wish list would have been in the sort of you know in the kind of not too distant future, but they may not have been operational at that point. 
at this point, there may already be kind of standard practice in there, but, but there may now be other aspects which you think, oh, well, actually, we could use AI, for example, far more, you know, you know, uh, efficiently or a lot more of it and, and so on and so forth. So, so how do you think about this when you think that a, a development that has now already taken seven years and it may take another three to five years to, for it to come to fruition and think about what might happen technologically over those three to five years. Um, is this, is this, do you, is this working in your favor or how do you, how do you, how do you deal with this? Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely working in my favor. You know, seven years ago, um, I think this project it was uh, it was a, a beautiful idea, but it looked you know very sci-fi to to everyone. And as for the fact that I started to work on this you know seven years ago, but it's just kind of gained the first really big prize three years ago. Is uh, is the fact that you know just the three years ago it started to be in the point that people start to recognize the need for this so so it is a visionary project but the visionary project needs as well the time to kind of uh you know be able that that the technology that i need is you know in development um and it did change a lot you know although the the ideas i i had seven years ago uh you know they they developed over the seven years they got much more concrete about the way how i want to apply the technology got much more concrete so i know how to work with it, actually integrate it but the concept didn't didn't really change because the concept was visionary already seven years ago and i mean this is beautiful about the architecture uh you know um i as well work on the projects, those, you know, are a large scale, those are, you know, outside of, of a continent, like projects that, you know, I work uh, for at the, at the company I work for. And and we see that many projects are in the, uh, in the planning stage, you know, five years, four or five years. And of course, uh, you know, that after the planning stage, you are going to have maybe another four years of them being on site. So when you start developing, your project might be built just 10 years later. And and many people don't realize it because maybe we are just kind of exposed to, to the small scale architecture where you know your your residential house might take a year and there is not such a big gap. But of course when we are talking about large scale projects, there really can be up to 10 years between the first draft and the final completion so the way how we design is always with looking forward to the future and thinking about how to make it future proof and the same is in the uh, in the case of the eighth continent you know it is developing and it's, it's fantastic that the technology is developing so fast so actually i am becoming more and more able about talking about this project as not just a visionary concept but something that can really happen and can be implemented and when you are talking about the AI, uh, you know, I started as well to do my, my own test with AI and, and, you know, doing some tests within the eight, eight continent uh, with the AI to, to see how it can help me. And, and, you know, of course, there are going to be technological ways how AI can help. This could be about the tracking uh, of the uh, of the currents, of the water currents, you know, technologically, uh, you know, looking at how much uh, water uh, is is being recycled, cleaned, looking at the, the waste, you know, reading the patterns uh, of, of the currents and the uh, and the patterns of, of movement uh, of the waste. So in this operational sense, there is going to be a large uh, possibility for implementing the AI, but it's as well in the design. You know, I am... Uh, I'm basing the design on, on the systems find in nature. So of course, having an AI which can help me to read the patterns uh, within uh, within the nature, within the organisms and patterns that I can then test uh, on the geometries, it's, it's really, really valuable for me. But you know, it's a, it's a process and although AI develop a lot, I mean, in the last year, what we saw in the next 20 generations, in the in the mid-journey or stable diffusion is a massive leap, but still the way how the AI can be really integrated into the project, which is, you know, beyond the mimicking, beyond the image which it creates, but which is about the systematic and where the AI needs to be really taught on certain libraries, that it's, it's more complicated, but it's, of course, it's fantastic that these tools are becoming into the 
everyday practice and and as well I can have access to them. Absolutely. And one of the thoughts that, of course, when I say this on the back of my mind is, is that, you know, I think that a large scale AI kind of uh, research projects they always need use cases. So, and it, you know, like uh, the eighth continent, of course, would be a great use case in so many ways for so many different technologies, not just AI. I'm just mentioning AI because it's so on top of everybody's mind at the moment. I'm sure there's plenty of technologies in there that I or many people have never heard of and that are really kind of quite central uh, to the eighth continent from an engineering point of view. But this this is really, really amazing. And um, I really do hope uh, that, that this project moves forward. I'm aware of the time. You have to go very soon. So let, let's wrap up. Let me thank you very much. And just one last question. I mean, I think it'd be really nice to carry on that conversation, say in, in 12 months time. Would it be okay if we have another another kind of conversation or dialogue uh, in in you know 2025 to see how you're getting on with this yes i'm um, i'm very very glad that you enjoyed the conversation and uh, i'm looking forward to talk to you again excellent excellent linka thank you ever so much for making time uh, uh, for me in your very busy uh, schedule uh, i wish you all the best of luck with all that's coming up this year um and, and i hope that the current and the downturn in the economy isn't affecting you guys as badly as it is affecting many others. So um, yeah, keep up the good work and uh, and we'll stay in touch. And if you ever pass through Berlin, I said this before, do give me a call, drop me a line, I'd be lovely to go for a cup of coffee. I will, definitely. Thank you very much. Linka, thank you ever so much. Have a good day, yeah? You too, bye. Thank you, bye-bye.